Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I'm Dr. Brad Roberts, the director of the Center for Global Security Research. And it's my pleasure to welcome you today to a very timely discussion as we find ourselves uh, at the brink of possible war with, uh, between Russia and Ukraine uh, for, for today's talk focused on options for deterring Russia. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome Kara Giles, uh, who will present the, the findings of a recent uh, project that he directed on this topic and a, and a report that's available online, which he'll describe. Uh, Kara is a senior consulting fellow at Chatham House in London. Uh, he is also the director of the Conflict Studies Research Center in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, this is an independent uh, research group that focuses on Eurasian security issues. Uh, in recent years, CARE's work has focused on two main uh, topical areas. The, he has a string of publications, first of all, on Russia's approach to conflict in cyberspace uh, and, and addressing also questions about how the West should respond. Uh, and secondly, he's, he has a number of broader projects on uh, the, the worldview of Russian leadership, uh, including what I think of as a seminal study on entitled, What Drives Russia to Confront the West? So he brings an excellent mix of the technical, operational, and the strategic dimensions to, to, to these topics. Uh, and today he's going to present to us the results of a uh, a Chatham House study on what deters Russia, which was released in September and, of course, uh, has become uh, highly salient to the unfolding crisis in, in Ukraine. So it's my pleasure to welcome you, Kira. Thanks so much for making the time to do this. Uh, Kira will offer about 30 minutes of opening remarks, uh, and then we'll have about 30 minutes of Q&A. Today's session will only run 60 minutes, not the usual 90. Uh, thanks so much for making the time. Thanks for your leadership on these issues. Kira, over to you. Thank you very much, Brad. Thanks for inviting me and for, and for the introduction. When Brad first contacted me about uh, coming to do this, uh, this report here was relatively fresh. What deters Russia from Chatham House out at the end of September? Of course, since then, a lot of the things that we were writing about in terms of successes and failures in deterring Russia have become very topical. So the way I'm going to, to frame this talk is by talking, first of all, about current events and then using them as a case study to illustrate some of the points that we put into the What Deters Russia report, which was a collection of case studies of successfully and unsuccessfully dealing with Russia and attempting to deter Russia from things we didn't want to do. Now, after, of course, the current round of confrontation between Russia and the US, we're going to have a lot more examples to build on. But one thing we found was a remarkable consistency and some principles that we could extract from each of these examples and case studies, which we summarized at the end. And I'm also going to summarize them at the end of this presentation, thinking about how we got to the current situation between Russia and the West, Russia and the United States, how that ties into the messages of deterrence that were in the report and whether it could have been different, done differently and what to do now. Because at the moment we are seeing the result of two concurrent processes, both of which are bound up with deterrence. First of all, there's the way Russia and the West as a whole have been speaking two different deterrent languages with no overlap between them and a complete failure of communication and communicating to the other what exactly was to be deterred. Russia is convinced that it has been telling the West what it found unacceptable and threatening consequences, but that message has not been received and internalized and understood in the way Russia wanted it to be. And of course, for as long as Russia wasn't explicitly stating its demands, then any of its hostile actions just looked like intimidation or irresponsible brinkmanship for no obvious reason. That all changed on the 18th of November last year when finally President Putin made that explicit link between troop buildups near Ukraine and a set of demands which he wanted to be met in order that there would be no action, no hostile action against Ukraine itself. Meanwhile, in the opposite direction, 
the West has been completely failing to convince Russia that pushing for what Russia wants will be resisted. That too has not been put across in terms that are meaningful to Moscow with the consequences made clear and the linkage between the demand and the result made explicit. And the second process that we've seen ongoing uh, that has combined to what we see today is a change in strategic outlook and mindset in Moscow toward a more assertive posture, one that's driven more by Russian desired strategic outcomes than by defensive concerns. And it sometimes surprises people when we talk about Russia being defensive, but it used to be possible to interpret many Russian hostile actions as being defensive in inspiration, if not in execution, whether it was trying to check what Moscow sees as the expansionist threat of the US or of Western institutions, or trying to assert Russia's claimed rights as a great power. And Russia took risks, including in Crimea and Eastern Ukraine and Syria, in order to head off what it anticipated would be serious defeats or setbacks. And even when it was assertive hostile action, there would be an attempt at deniability in those offensive actions. But the recent actions that we see from Russia show a more assertive posture that's driven by desired outcomes where Russia wants to achieve things. And it applies not only to the actions themselves, which no longer seek deniability, but also to how Russia presents them, which is no longer aiming to maintain the fiction that they're well-intentioned. Russia is deciding what it wants to do and then going ahead and doing it regardless of international opinion and consequences. And as part of that, it is now no longer content with the borders of its influence and power, and so is attempting to unilaterally revise them. What we see is the events of the last part of last year, in fact, more or less starting immediately after we published this report, very conveniently, not as a series of isolated incidents, but indicators of a coherent program for Moscow to achieve its vision through what it sees as its enhanced strength and increased willingness to use it. If we think back to those last four months of last year, in September, we had overt rather than subtle blackmail of Europe over the Nord Stream 2 pipeline at a time of gas price crisis across Europe. In October, we had all final links for, with NATO for dialogue cut. In November, we had the test of a, an anti-satellite weapon, again, regardless of the consequences, the inevitable international condemnation, not to mention the hazard to space operations. And then finally, in December, the one that really gets everybody's attention, the threats to Ukraine trying to extort a promise of accommodation for Russia's interests from the United States. And here, too, we can break that trend down into two coinciding subcategories of what is actually driving this movement towards a new strategic mindset for Russia. There's capability and there's confidence. And for Russia, of course, the basic criterion of state power is and remains military strength. Let's not forget Russia's military modernization program had a term date, an end date specified for 2020 last year, along with a whole raft of other strategic documentation. So from their point of view, in theory, they were supposed to be ready by now for the big confrontation with the West. And it does seem that they feel that their relative strength at the moment is either optimum or at least sufficient to achieve what they want. And the second element, the confidence. Based on the consistent success that Russia has enjoyed in previous assertive actions against Western interests, because with localized exceptions, deterrence of challenges from Russia has failed. Most of the positive examples of deterrence that we have uh, included in this report actually date back much further than the post-Cold War period, with isolated exceptions since the end of the USSR. But primarily, the lessons, the key lessons for how to behave come from earlier periods of history. Simply put, there haven't been any countermeasures imposed on Russia that outweigh the benefits that Russia actually gains from a hostile action. In addition to that, augmenting this, Russia has also learned over the long term, but confirmed over the last eight years in particular, that its aggressive actions are the best way to achieve its objectives. Because those objectives generally aren't recognized or understood by the West, because they're incompatible with Western priorities or values, causing damage has proved to be the most effective way of getting attention. 
and getting adversaries to do what Russia wants, even if on occasion what Russia wants is no more than summits and dialogue and recognition and, and respect in that very peculiar Russian sense that really doesn't translate into English. And of course, it's achieved precisely that time after time through causing damage, whether it is in cyber attacks, whether it's around Ukraine, whether it's the trying to adjust the deconfliction boundaries in Syria, etc., etc., etc. It is Russia carrying out some kind of hostile action that gets the results it wants. And what we found in terms of the sub-threshold space, in terms of competition without spilling over into conflict, is that the internal debate among Russian military thought leaders that we've observed on those boundaries between war and peace, between competition and conflict, has been overtaken by events. Rather than being set by Russian doctrine, the limits of sub-threshold activities have receded because of the lack of firm responses by Russia's adversaries to overtly warlike actions. Because in each case, those Western allies have not responded to Russian actions in a manner that Moscow considers significant. So what that means is the boundaries of what Russia considers sub-threshold have correspondingly expanded. And you can see that principle at work in all domains, at least all of the ones that are open to people like me who are working exclusively from open sources and in all geographical areas. And it means that these activities, the Western activities, what, how where the West responds to Russia, have shaped Russia's approach to competition primarily through failing to deter it when assertiveness transitions to aggression. Now that's augmented by the peculiar deterrent messaging style from Russia, the way in which Russia tries to communicate its, its messages of deterrence and compellence and intimidation, which is another overlapping concept in the Russian doctrine. The message has not received and understood because of this different language and culture. What that means is that there is likely to be more damage to come from Moscow. And again, it sometimes surprises people when we talk about the likelihood of further escalation from the current situation, at least it did before the threat to Ukraine developed, because people look at the pattern of activities after 2014 and the seizure of Crimea. They look at assassinations across Europe, hostile use of electronic warfare in the far north of Europe, the, um, the overtly warlike acts of blowing up ammunition depots in Czech Republic and Bulgaria in 2014, and say, where do you escalate to from there? But then if we look back over the longer span of history, there is a lot more stuff that Russia has traditionally done to harm our interests that isn't happening at the moment. To take just one example, think back to the Cold War and Russian and Chinese sponsorship of violent terrorist movements that were trying to kill and maim in Western capitals. We haven't seen that yet. Let's not be surprised if we do see that in the not too distant future. Because Russia persists in thinking that it can get its way through intimidation, not attraction. That is the default setting. Of course, it's counterproductive, unless in situations where Russia is not resisted and can apply force with no countermeasures to what it's doing. But in other occasions where Russia does not actually have full control over the situation, this intimidatory approach often has the opposite effect to what Russia actually desires. The classic paradox now, of course, is that Russia is demanding no more countries join NATO and the way in which it is reinforcing this demand of military threats is precisely what persuades countries to join NATO. But this is nothing new. This has been a pattern that has been repeated over the last eight years with greater and greater insistence from Moscow still getting the opposite results. If we look at the repeated threats to countries like Sweden and Finland over the issue of joining NATO and the response to those threats, each time it pushes the populations in those countries towards further towards the realization that actually NATO is the answer to the challenge they're facing. So Russia does habitually shoot itself in the foot with its messaging, but it can't help it because this is, after all, a product of Russian social norms. It's a zero-sum society where it's not enough to be in a position of power. Power actually has to be exercised. And the notion of soft power in the Western sense is entirely alien to Russian thinking as well as being impossible to translate into Russian. The problem is the fact that the United States and NATO 
and the Euro-Atlantic community simply have not imposed costs on Russia at a level that would dissuade Russia from this trajectory. And this has fed Russia's willingness to set red lines limiting the behavior of other countries backed up by the threat of direct action up to and including military force. And now, as we see at the end of last year, Russia thinks it can achieve much more, presenting a, a Christmas list of demands for Western cooperation in extending Russian power westwards over our allies. A lot of people have debated whether Russia and Putin sincerely believe that uh, its demands are achievable. And I think that they may well do, at least some of them, because if you look at Russia's pattern of failing to understand the West, uh, it makes a lot more sense. The belief that the United States can and does direct NATO and direct the policy of other countries, it's in charge and it dictates what happens among these consensus organizations. In effect, the same thing that Russia is asking for in the countries it considers part of its own domain. And Russia asking for settlements along the lines of past peace treaties like Yalta, like the Congress of Vienna, these precedents of victorious great powers which are dividing their spheres of influence and deciding who will run which part of the world between them, regardless of the wishes of the people who live there. It's not compatible with 21st century Europe. But then so much else of Russia is exactly the same. Russia is operating now in a mindset from a previous century with all of the explicit and implicit ways in which it's attempting to emulate the Soviet Union. But it's also looking for a Soviet-style great power deal. If the United States buys into this approach, it will encourage Russia further. And unfortunately, there have been indications of this happening. Talks on strategic stability in cyber, which adopts unquestioningly Russia's terminology and framing of the question, just encourage Russia to think that the United States is ready to negotiate on Russian terms and reinforce this picture of Russia as the opposite pole in the old Cold War style. The maximalist demands that we see from Russia make it feel like a success to some Western politicians if even some of those are rejected, but still the Russia problem goes away temporarily. It looks like concessions to Russia, which, uh, as Russian politicians put it, um, putting forward the treaty uh, proposals as, quote, starting point to look for some middle ground. Unfortunately, the middle ground between something which is totally unacceptable and the status quo is still a substantial win for Russia and a substantial degradation for European security. It is a classic Russian approach of demanding the whole of somebody else's cake and then after much noise and negotiation, grudgingly settling to stealing only half of it. But Russia demanding limits of the sovereignty of its neighbors, a veto on their foreign policy and their security policy choices backed by the threat of military force. So the question has to be, is this actually acceptable? And that's a question which doesn't seem to be being asked publicly at the moment. Is the West really willing to roll back the, the security guarantees for those frontline states to Russia and roll back the, very, the borders of free and independent nations and consign millions of people to the condition Russia wants its neighbors in, undemocratic and impoverished and dependent? If the answer is no, the next choice is where and at what cost you put up a stop sign for Russia, which up until now has not happened. Because the message that is being projected publicly to Russia at the moment is, do not escalate in Europe, which is important but it's very different from the core message that, underline, that addresses the underlying issues, which is the age of empires is over and no country has the right to dictate to its neighbors in the way in which you are claiming to be able to do. So what we see now is a response to the direct threat to Ukraine. That's one choice. Or we can tackle this later by dealing with this just as a Ukraine issue which would allow Russia to persist in the beliefs, first, that it has these rights over other countries, and second, that military force is actually the best way to assert them. Now, Russia believes these because it hasn't yet been challenged by any direct messaging enforced by a setback that demonstrates that military power is no longer the concern. The problem there is Russia is still at the, the post-imperial phase of development where success, recent success, is in resisting the rolling back of its power support this belief that actually it still is a great power.
an imperial power, one that has those great power rights over other countries. Russia hasn't been defeated yet and therefore has no reason to think otherwise. Now what that means in turn is that the choices that are made now in response to these current Russian demands are determining not only the future of allies and partners in Europe, but actually will shape Russia itself. Setting the limits of Russian power and enforcing them, if necessary, by facing them down or by force is an essential first step in the long-term transition of Russia from a frustrated former empire which lashes out to try to regain its former status into a normal country that is capable of coexisting with others. The problem is that process, which we've seen play out in all of the other European empires, simply hasn't started yet. Now, thinking of the, the terms of the treaties themselves, nothing there, nothing of the Russian demands ought to be acceptable, but the risk is they may still be accepted. Because one of the key patterns that comes out again and again from the Chatham House report is the way in which conflict-averse Western leaders have a track record of enforcing Russia's demands through being terrified of the alternative. Russia has been highly successful in, in spreading the idea of imminent danger and also of ex escalation to a nuclear level, which is even repeated in the text of the treaties. So Russia might once again be perfectly reasonably counting on success because of the past consistent responses to Russia's demands and threats and military action. We've seen this play out over and over again in the resolution to armed conflicts in Georgia, in Ukraine with the extempted Minsk agreements, in Syria, where it is the Western powers that impose the ceasefires drafted in Moscow on the victims of Russian aggression. So Russia has no reason other than to think that this might be repeated now. But the sad fact is that there might simply be no exit from this mismatch, this incompatibility of perceptions of how the world works, other than a trial of strength. That might be the only option sooner or later. It might be bloody and messy and damaging, but now that Russia has made the choice to go down the route of aggression, others don't really have a wide choice of how to respond. It is either respond in kind or take the path of surrender, which has been the consistent response to military action so far, because Western leaders prioritize ending or avoiding a conflict over achieving an outcome in it that is actually successful. Russia, meanwhile, just wants to win the war. So it's normal and it's natural and it's human to hope that there will be a way out of the current situation that doesn't involve a fight, but it would be highly dangerous once again to base all assumptions, or base all decisions on that hope which has been turned into, into an assumption which is actually driving decision-making processes. What alarms people in Eastern Europe is the way the decision on Ukraine appears to have already been made. When you hear language from President Biden about finding, quote, an accommodation, end quote, for Russia's concerns, or treating Russia's demands as an acceptable topic of conversation, endorsing them by saying, yes, this is something to negotiate about. And still more, when there's an advertisement that there will be no military direct support to Ukraine. Both the United States and the UK and a number of other nations have stated this explicitly. Based on the case studies that we put together in the Chatham House Deterrence Report, it is baffling why Western leaders continue to do this, continue to advertise what they will not do in order to support their friends and partners. Regardless of how realistic it might be to suddenly find American or British troops facing the Russians in Ukraine, it encourages Russia, by ruling this out, encourages Russia and provides comfort and confidence to Moscow's planners by removing a huge range of worst case scenarios from their planning. It simplifies their risk calculus by removing certainty. It's not at all clear why this mistake is made over and over again. Looking to the future, any future Russian action against democracies is going to be primarily determined by the current reaction to Russia's current demands. So Russia can, based on past performance, reasonably assume that major European powers like France and Germany will try to force states to find ways to placate Russia. And if the US also appears to prioritize dialogue and in particular de-escalation over support for its friends and allies, Russia will, as it has done so many times before, 
deduce that it can escalate cost-free and it can leverage its considerable success in persuading political leaders and public opinion that the consequences of resisting Russia would be major war with that possible escalation to a nuclear war. So if the decision is made to not protect Ukraine against Russia, that decision will be faced again when Russia makes its next demands on its next country. Now the problem is that Russia's new confidence means that its assumption of entitlement and exceptionalism and its aspiration to be a, dis a ubiquitous power in global competition now poses a more direct and a more immediate threat to Western interests, not just in Europe, but globally. Because this idea of Russia as itself as, as a great power, meaning that it is a global power, also means that it has rights everywhere, again, in a very 19th century sense. And Russia is asserting these rights wherever it can around the world, both in its traditional areas of interest and connections, but also in places that have historically been of no relevance to Russia or the Soviet Union at all. And it does so according to a very consistent pattern. Russia moves into vacuums wherever they occur, whether it's a vacuum of interest, whether it's the, the former colonial powers that have lost interest in supporting their former protégés, like uh, France in the Central African Republic, like the UK in Fiji, or if it's a vacuum of stability, like in Syria or, or Libya or Mali, or if it's a vacuum of competition where Russia can step in to supply those few attractive offers it has to countries that are under Western sanctions. For example, supplying arms to Zimbabwe in exchange for effectively the, the country's platinum industry or a vacuum of rule of law. Because if you look at the success or failure of state-sponsored projects in Southern Africa, for example, you see inverse proportion between the remaining strength of rule of law in those countries and the success of Russian operations. Where there is still strong anti-corruption legislation, civilian control, security sector reform, Russia's ambitions fail. Where they can exploit corruption and weak rule of law, they tend to succeed. But most importantly, if worldwide we give Russia confidence that these vacuums of interest will persist and that American in particular aid to friends and partners will be limited and conditional, it is not only Russia that will learn lessons from this and persist in the course of assertiveness. Other powers, most notably China, are also going to watch closely how the West as a whole responds to the current threats and gauge its willingness to support its friend and allies against aggression. So they will adjust their plans accordingly based on what comes out of the world confrontation. So let me pull all of those threads back together and bring it back to some of the, the very specific policy recommendations that, uh, that we arrived at on the basis of all of these case studies that we put together in the report. Let's refer back to, to what we actually had in here and you will recognize immediately how they relate to the current situation and possibly how to avoid it and happening in the future. One of the very specific things we asked for was don't say what we will not do to defend yourself or your partners. Don't self-deter by avoiding meeting a direct challenge because de-escalation taken to its logical conclusion is, is the same as surrender. Don't prioritize avoiding or ending conflict over ensuring that a confrontation actually arrives at an outcome which is acceptable for your own side. We also suggested uh, principles for countermeasures specifically to sub-threshold attacks. Some of them are permanent and some of them are already enacted. We suggested learn from the frontline states and what they have done to close gaps and ensure their own societal resilience. Look at tactical successes where they have been achieved, like the Cyber Deterrence Initiative. It's not a strategic end to the challenge, but it does succeed in imposing costs and friction that has a limited deterrent effect in that way. But what we do see also in terms of deterring threats that are not specifically military is a gap in the defenses of the West. There is no equivalent to NATO that will try to combine efforts and mutually support against some threshold threats and build on the lessons of solidarity and transparency that are to be so important in resisting Russian hybrid attacks. 
the EU in particular has failed to meet both the challenge and the commitments that it took upon itself to cover that gap, to deal with the stuff that NATO doesn't in Europe, its commitments in the, in the Warsaw Summit. We have been consistently suggesting that what is required instead is a different supranational organization, which is modeled on the Joint Expeditionary Force, the JEF, the club of like-minded nations across the top of the Euro-Atlantic community that can intervene bypassing NATO and bypassing the, the, the problems of achieving NATO consensus. We need the same thing to bypass the EU. Topically, what, <clears throat> what I would suggest uh, and have already suggested to American policymakers looking for specific tactical options for dealing with the current situation over and above those that have been widely reported in open sources is making counter proposals to Russia which play on Russia's beliefs and making threats that actually fall in with how Russia thinks the world works as opposed to ones which are entirely irrelevant to Russia's view of international relations. Minor examples. If Russia does sincerely believe that the United States runs NATO and can bring countries in at will, and we saw the language from President Putin about NATO dangerously attempting to seize Ukrainian territory, then why not let Russia think that if it persists down the current path, the United States will fast track Sweden and Finland into NATO, which is a distinctly undesirable outcome for Russia. If Russia thinks the United States directs its allies and directs their policy, then why not let them think that the US will tell the UK to enforce its anti-money laundering legislation, which will pose a direct problem for Putin's friends and his family and his girlfriends and his progeny. And why do we not at this point match Russia by injecting mad ideas, floating options that would be highly uncomfortable for Russia, whether they're realistic or not? Ordinarily, not a good idea if we want to preserve stability because there's an element of predictability that is assisting instability. However, we've already departed from stability. You'd rule out the worst case scenarios for Russia by being uh, uh, relatively predictable. But now there may be an argument for being irrational like Russia to make that risk calculus for Moscow more complicated under normal circumstances, yes, we want to preserve stability. Now, however, it's not about preventing destabilization, but about emerging from an unstable situation without any major losses. We may not be able anymore to rely on rational assessment by Russia of what is going on outside, because after all, Vladimir Putin's evident sense of personal grievance and emotional investment in what's happening now, in the restitution of Russian power, and the rolling back of the West will probably prejudice any objective assessment of national interest. But one of the key ways of getting around the failure of the language of deterrence projected towards Moscow that we encountered time and time again while compiling the report is to engage with Russia on terms that Moscow itself understands. Brad, ladies and gentlemen, that's uh, the end of my prepared piece, and I'm greatly looking forward to questions and answers. Well, that was uh, a sobering and very compelling assessment. Thank you for, for an excellent set of remarks. Mm -hmm.